Thanks for joining us again. We want to talk today about medieval Islamic societies. Now, last class period, we ended with the discussion of the early Middle Ages and really kind of the marker, the defining point in moving from the era of the ancient world of Greece and Rome into the Middle Ages. That, that marker is the fall of Rome in 476 CE, and we talked about the western half of the empire being carved up among many of the so-called Germanic tribal peoples, but the eastern half of the empire will live on and actually thrive for another thousand years. After the fall of Rome and the west, the so-called Byzantine Empire. So now we're entering into the, the era of the Middle Ages. The Byzantine Empire excelled at keeping some scholarship alive during the early Middle Ages when in western Europe there's just not a whole lot going on intellectually. What we see in the Byzantine Empire is, though, is really it's it's not just the fact that they didn't suffer as much kind of internal turmoil and confusion as a result of, of these raids by tribal peoples, but they were able to keep some scholarship alive also by virtue of the fact that they're trading with uh, the Muslim world during the Middle Ages that they trade significantly in the eastern Mediterranean, they trade in North Africa, they trade in the Arabian Peninsula. And the newest center for learning during the Middle Ages is not going to even be the Byzantine Empire. It's going to be their neighbors in the Arabian Peninsula and in North Africa that will be pioneering in the latest fields of medicine and engineering and a number of different endeavors. So why is this the case? Why is the Islamic world going to sort of carry the torch for learning in the Middle Ages? Well, some of it has to do with the fact that the Christian world, as we've already mentioned, especially in Western Europe, is so divided, everything is so haphazard due to these invasions. But a lot of it will also have to do with the faith of Islam itself, which emphasizes seeking knowledge, not just religious knowledge, but worldly knowledge as well. And the faith of Islam begins with its founder, Muhammad. Muhammad was born on the Arabian Peninsula in 570 CE in the city of Mecca. You can see it here. It's close to the Red Sea. But this is a very harsh environment. You're talking about uh, a, a city which really serves quite literally as an oasis in the middle of a sun-baked expanse of desert. So you can see the map of the trade routes here that I have on the slide. Mecca is at the intersection of several major trade routes crisscrossing the Arabian deserts, connecting uh, people with life-sustaining goods that they need in an environment that receives so little rainfall in which you can't grow crops for yourself. These camel caravans through the region are the lifeblood of this area. He's born into the Quraysh clan and unfortunately at a young age suffered several tragedies. His father passed away in the year of his birth. His mother passed away when he was just six years old. So Muhammad was really raised by his extended family as a member of the Quraysh clan. And very early on, we'll see that this will make a deep impression upon him. The idea that the community takes care of all of its members. As far as early religious teachings are concerned, he grew up in the polytheistic faith of his peoples. Uh, typically, you have sort of a father parent deity and then you have a series of, of sons and daughters, sort of lesser deities that interact more closely with humans. And in addition, the city of Mecca itself in which he was born was a religious um, center for people of this polytheistic faith. They would often congregate in the city and visit the temple there in the center of the city. Uh, and it was considered a place where you put aside all your rivalries, any sort of blood feuds among various clans and tribes. When you came into the city of Mecca, you laid all that aside and you worshipped in peace. In addition to being exposed to his native polytheistic faith, we'll see he will be exposed to monotheistic faiths as well. He will meet in the vibrant, bustling city streets of Mecca. He will meet with Jewish priests. He will meet up with Christian, traveling Christian priests as well. According to at least one story, when he was between 9 to 12 years old, he also visited Syria with his uncle and reportedly met and conversed with a Christian monk at length while he was there. 
So his religious education is very diverse, shall we say. And as an adult, Muhammad became a merchant who traveled with some of these tribal caravans, managing them through the Arabian desert just north of Syria. When he was 25, he met and married the widow of a wealthy merchant, and at that point became a man of means. Yet even though his life became significantly easier in a sort of material sense after his marriage, even in early age, Muhammad was already developing a keen social conscience. In fact, he gradually became something of a social activist in his hometown of Mecca as he began to criticize openly the materialism of everyone around him, their pursuit of paganism, the unjust treatment of the poor and needy routinely received at the hands of the wealthy. Muhammad was also consumed with the big epic spiritual questions. Why are we here? What does this mean? And he eventually decided in middle age to kind of turn his back on the greed and the materialism of many people in Mecca, and he would travel outside the city of Mecca to the caves there to get some peace and quiet, to clear his head, to meditate calmly, and to hope to gain some insight into these spiritual questions that had been plaguing him for so long. Then in 610, at the age of 40, Muhammad had a vision that would change his life forever. Muhammad reportedly saw the archangel Gabriel, the same one who in the Christian tradition who had appeared to the Virgin Mary. This angel made known to the merchant the will of one God called Allah. Multiple conversations followed later. Muhammad memorized his communications with the angel Gabriel, and eventually the collected text of these conversations became known as the Quran, the holy book of Islam, which his followers compiled over a seven-decade span of time. So what did Muhammad preach? First and foremost, Islam will develop as a monotheistic religion. The basic message Muhammad received from Gabriel was a summons to all Arabs to submit to God. In fact, the word Islam itself means submission to the will of God. And it's worth noting that this deity is very similar, really actually identical to the Christian and Jewish deities. This deity was all-knowing, all-powerful, an eternal figure. And like Christianity and Judaism, Islam also emphasized that man should thank God for making the world as it is and stressed that God expected men to be generous with their wealth and to help the poor and needy. At first glance, then, it seems like there's not a whole lot new in Muhammad's message. Obedience to an omnipotent God had already been preached for centuries by Jewish and then later Christian prophets. And certainly, Muhammad believes that there's a tie to the revelations made to him by the angel Gabriel. There, the, the religion of Islam is very much intimately tied with both Christianity and Judaism. In fact, Muhammad uh, believed that the angel Gabriel confirmed both the Old and New Testaments, and Muslims began to identify Jews and Christians as fellow people of the book, that they all shared a common Abrahamic uh, tradition of monotheism. Where Islam begins to deviate, though, significantly, especially from Christianity, is that while he believed that Jesus of Nazareth was a very wise religious prophet along the lines of Abraham and uh, you know, Moses and many others, he did not believe that Jesus was, in fact, the son of a deity and, and a human and someone that represented a chance for salvation. In fact, according to Muhammad, Christians and Jews had sort of strayed away from the core principles of, uh, of holding a deep faith over time. And he believed that among this long list of prophets that their God had sent to them to get people back on track, that he was the last of these prophets sent to try to get people to focus more on their faith, their piety. And so at the core of this new faith is the so-called five pillars of Islam. The first being the assertion that there is, in fact, only one deity and that the, the final prophet is Muhammad. Muhammad believed that prayer was essential for maintaining a close relationship between yourself and th this deity. So a requirement, it's not optional, a requirement of prayer five times each day. A requirement of bodily suffering to not only sort of cleanse your body, uh, but also to show your willingness to sacrifice uh, for the greater good. A requirement of fasting, going without food or drink during the daylight hours for one month of the year, which of course later becomes known as the holy month of Ramadan in Islam. 
requirement of fasting, another of the five pillars of Islam. Also a requirement that you must give some of your wealth to those in need. So charity, helping out those in your community who maybe are not doing as well. And then finally, followers were directed to go at least once in their lifetime on a pilgrimage to the city where Islam was born to visit the holy temple in the center of Mecca to perform the Hajj. All these were rules to strengthen your faith and to keep you close to God. How did Islam grow over time? Well, at first, Muhammad managed to convert members of his family to begin with. His wife Hadija, for example, uh, was the first. Uh, but gradually, he began to transform his home city of Mecca as droves of the poor and needy began following the Prophet. This makes sense, doesn't it, right? A, a religion that emphasizes taking care of everyone in the community, uh, you're going to see traction, right? You're going to see the first, some of the first adherents being the poor and the outcast in society. And by 622, Muhammad's success in winning converts had not only earned him those followers, but it earned him some pretty high-profile enemies in his hometown of Mecca, those who didn't believe in this faith and rejected many of its principles. And so in 622, he is forced to flee his home city of Mecca, and he will travel... Uh, you know, about 240 miles north of the city of Mecca to the city of Medina. You can see it here on the map. This flight was known as the Hajira. And this is very important in the religion of Islam. It basically resets their calendar at such an important date. Despite his exile, Muhammad's success continued in Medina as the Muslim faith really took off there. Even though his community would implement very strict rules governing your diet, uh, wine was prohibited, gambling, usury were all outlawed. Um, he set up his own legal system there as well, but still you continue to see traction. You can see, can you continue to see adherents uh, joining this new faith. Before long, his followers began banding together to support their new leader, and uh, gradually by 624, Muhammad's army of the faithful had become powerful enough to go back to his home city in Mecca. In fact, by 630, Muhammad was able to successfully, finally, return to Mecca in triumph, where the city's temple, pagan temple, was cleansed of all of its idols and reappropriated for use by the followers of this new faith. Unfortunately, after Muhammad passed away in 632, there was some squabbling among his religious followers concerning the issue of who should succeed as leader of the religion. Many of the Prophet's followers wanted the elders in the community to determine who would succeed him. His trusted advisor, Abu Bakr, was chosen to lead the Ummah, or the community, and became the first caliph, or successor. The Sunni, in other words, were those who believed in the elders choosing the right man for the job. A smaller group, though, those that become known as the Shia, or partisans of Ali, believed that it should be a family member that should succeed the prophet after his death to steer the community of the faithful. Now, there's not really any, any differences in doctrine, um, but we will see unfortunately the the rift between the Sunni and the Shia deepening over time rather than it reconciling. For example, by the time the Quran or the holy book was finally written down some 80 years after the death of Muhammad, two civil wars had already erupted between the Sunni and the Shia and violence over whether the succession to the caliphate or the leader of the community um, just continued over time and in fact resulted in the creation of the first Islamic dynasty, that of the Umayyads. The Umayyads were part of a very wealthy and powerful clan in the region based out of the city of Mecca. And under the caliphates of Umar and Uthman, uh, when Ali finally became the fourth caliph or leader of the religious community in 656, uh, while this made the Shia contingent happy, the Sunni said, no, Ali is not our man. So for the Sunni-based Umayyads, they saw this as a challenge to their dynasty. They rebelled against Ali's leadership and established their own hereditary dynasty. And during this period, as you can see from the map, you will see uh, a lot of territory in North Africa and through the Iranian plateau will be captured by uh, the Umayyad leadership. As these invaders crossed into so many new territories and people of different faiths and different ethnicities and what have you, it's going to be uh, a difficult a juggling act to try and govern this many people in such a, a highly diverse empire. 
The Amai leadership tried to work with the many different divergent populations under its leadership, but several key points of tension still arose over time. Ethnic pressures, the Umayyads tended to prefer only Arabs being placed in positions of authority. Secondly, we will see ongoing religious tensions between the Sunni and Shia continuing to cause problems from within. In fact, another civil war will erupt during the mid-18th century, and this will lead to the rise of the Abbasid Empire. Abbasid leadership will tap into the angry, frustrated groups of people kept out of power by the Umayyads. Groups like the Persians, the Shias, and other groups who had been marginalized, they felt, under Umayyad leadership, the Abbasids used them to help topple the control of the Umayyads. They moved their capital to Baghdad, and they, um, and then at that point, Persian influences became very important for the Abbasid empire. But the Abbasids were successful in learning from the mistakes of the Umayyads. They opened up the ranks of government service to people from all backgrounds. Jews, for example, often served as bankers and financial advisors. Persians assumed positions as bureaucrats and scribes. Christians often served as engineers and diplomats. And by this period of Abbasid reign, it had developed uh, into really an, an international intellectual bright spot during the Middle Ages, especially around the city of Baghdad. Quranic schools were set up across these expanding Muslim empires. Also many libraries were set up in Muslim empires, extending the knowledge of the natural world. For example, Cordoba's main library, established by the Umayyad leader Hakim II, housed 600,000 manuscripts and served really as an embryonic university during the early Middle Ages, attracting not just Muslim scholars but Christian and Jewish scholars as well. Arab intellectuals also developed the ancient Greek legacy in science and medicine. For instance, Arab scholar al kindi who lived during the 9th century CE, performed dozens of experiments with light and heat, color and optics, perfumes and drugs. Another Muslim thinker, al-Razi, who lived during the late 9th and early 10th centuries, made great strides in medicine through his classic treatise in which he distinguished between the deadly diseases of smallpox and measles. Other Islamic physicians were learning how to use sedatives, antiseptics, how to suture wounds together. During the Middle Ages, Islamic scholars made advances in astronomy and mathematics by studying Greek masters like Euclid and Ptolemy. It was from India that Islamic mathematicians, for instance, imported the system of numerals that we still use today, 1 through 9 plus the numeral 0. In all, this period is often referred to as the Islamic Golden Age of Learning because it is Muslim scholars that are advancing the frontiers of science and medicine and intellectual inquiry during this period. One good example of an Islamic scholar making great strides in many different fields was Ibn Sina, or Ibn Sina. You can see the alternate spellings of his name here on the slide. He was born in 980 in present-day Uzbekistan of Persian heritage. Ibn Sina grew up learning how to read and write and had a natural talent for both. By the age of 10, for example, the boy had already memorized the Quran by heart. By age 16, Ibn Sina had turned to medicine, a discipline that he would continue to practice throughout his life. At the age of 17, when the Sultan of Bukhara, the local leader, fell ill with an ailment that baffled the court physicians, Ibn Sina was called to his bedside and actually cured him. In gratitude, the Sultan opened up the Royal Samanid Library to him. The only payment he wanted, in other words, for saving the Sultan's life was, can I get in to your manuscripts? Can I learn more about different topics? Over his lifetime, Ibn Sina wrote almost 100 books in numerous fields, including mathematics, geometry, astronomy, physics, philology, music, poetry. His most lasting work was the large, one million word long medical encyclopedia, which became known as the canon, in which he categorized diseases and their treatments. This became a critical compendium of knowledge, medical knowledge at that time, and was used by Western physicians up until the 17th century. Patronage was very important for many of these medieval scholars to continue their work. They need the help of powerful leaders, those who can finance their research. And a well-known patron of the Islamic arts and scholarship was Harun al-Rashid. He was the uh, Abbasid Caliph of Baghdad and himself was a scholar and poet well-versed in history, tradition, and poetry. He was known for gathering around him a number of learned men, poets, jurists, 
grammarians and scribes and musicians, all who enjoyed his patronage. He was also known for establishing the library, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, which became a world center for the study of humanities and sciences, including mathematics, astronomy, medicine, chemistry, zoology, and geography. Unfortunately, after Harun al-Rashid's death, fighting between his sons caused internal fissures to develop in the Abbasid Empire. This leads to a series of warlords rising to power and territories being lost to Abbasid control. We will also see that the Shia over time will simply split off to form their own empires, such as the Fatimid dynasty that will rule Egypt for several centuries, or the Safavid dynasty in Persia, ruling much later on. The final Abbasid Caliph was for, forced out of power by the Mongols in 1258, but really their empire had crumbled several centuries before that. And we'll be talking much more about the Mongols, incidentally, later on in this course. <laughs>